Hi guys, we finally got our wood stove installed about a week ago now and it's been keeping the house toasty at 75 degrees which is awesome when it has been down to the single digits too many times this winter. There are many considerations that go into the decision of installing a wood burning stove but today we're covering the step-by-step -step install of our stove and how we connected the stove pipe through the roof, connected the chimney, and some of the reasons behind why and what we did. many different options of wood stove on the market it can be a head spin trying to decide which is right for you we went with the Englander wood burning stove which is rated to heat up to 2,000 square foot um, when it's burning seasoned cordwood it's a free standing design which allowed us to be have some versatility in where we placed it and also has a large firebox which holds logs of up to 18 inches in length I would consider this stove as a sort of middle of the range stove and that's based on its retail price it's available from Home Depot However, it really was the independent online review sites that sealed the deal for us since it came out with great customer satisfaction reports across the board. It's also an EPA certified stove, which means that it meets EPA clean air standards. And basically, because the stove is designed to be more efficient using less wood to create more heat, it generates less smoke and a reduced creosote buildup than the older types of non-certified stoves. For the install itself, we bought a double wall stove pipe and a triple wall chimney, which you see here, and through the roof installation kit with um, plenty of silicone to seal everything up again. And I'll share more info on all of these parts as we go through the step by step. Before we get going with the install, if you're looking for a floor pad solution, after considering the options that were on the market, we decided to make our own floor pad and I'll link the video for how we did that in the description box below. Okay, let's get going. After we set the stove in place, Caleb used a laser and a level to find the central spot on the roof for the pipe to go through and then worked from there to make the right sized opening for the roof box to sit inside. This was not as messy as I thought it would be, but it's a good idea to have a dust cloth down to catch the debris from making a hole in the roof. I was expecting a 2x6 uh, rafter. This is 2x10. And and he's got a lot more insulation in it, which is nice. It's really good. Did it well.
gonna do a little more song here. We need more natural light in our life. It's good vitamin D. Okay, this is the ceiling support box. And uh, it, it, you'll look at it. The chimney on the inside will come up to here. And then you'll see a little bit of this because obviously our, our ceiling is at an angle. So that's what it will you'll see and then on the inside will sit the chimney that will sit on the outside which is the outside of the house and then there'll be some flashing that'll go around the the chimney this is our front okay f you gotta remember that so if you come around here and you and i push it down to the drywall and you see my pencil marks you'll be like okay this is it and then up there, I've got to make lines, and then I'm going to cut and fold over. Okay. So we purchased the Duravent up through the ceiling basic kit from Home Depot that can be used for flat or vaulted ceilings. It comes with a 23 inch tall ceiling support box which shields the insulation from your chimney pipe. And then it also comes with a stove pipe adapter and roof flashing and a chimney cap. We do have a vaulted ceiling as you can see, so you want to make sure that your through the roof installation kit has the correct parts to fit your situation. Because we live in a converted shed right now, there is not a great deal of attic space, which meant that we needed to trim the roof box down to the right height to fit the gap between the ceiling through to the roof. So that's just to mention that you will want to consider the space inside your own attic before you purchase your roof kit. and these flaps these ears I got to trim them down they're gonna they're gonna get nailed right to the top of the roof to the roof and then uh, uh, they'll get nailed here and then uh, here. it's so warm out here yeah it is and then this flashing once I put the chimney in then I'll put all kinds of silicone and that flashing will sit and then I'll put the chimney on, and then this flashing will go over the chimney like that. That's, that's the idea. silicone this one's called through the roof it's uh it says it seals leaks and asphalt can't meaning the for uh, uh anyway for asphalt shingles this works good um it's it's it, it firms up really well but it still stays pliable and uh 
This one's is good to where it'll stick right to wet surfaces and then even in really cold temperatures. Uh, so we're still in February, but it's 50 degrees right now. So um, I'm trying to take advantage of the weather now because we got the nice day. So this will set up a lot better in this weather. So we have a hole in our roof and we need to get it sealed up now. So now I'm in a hurry to get it all done. So. Perfectly level, right there. When we come and re-shingle this roof, to get this piece of flashing off, it'll be it'll be interesting. Ideally, when you shingle, you're gonna shingle, when you come up, you'll shingle halfway to the flashing point, and then as you keep going, you will shingle over top of this. So, really a good shingler I'm a, at least for a boot or whatever, you shingle down halfway and then the rest gets exposed because then that covers over the rest of your shingles. But that's not gospel, so don't take my word for it. I'm not a roofer. Yeah, <sighs> But you don't have to take my word for it. Bar Burton would say. MacGyver, MacGruber. Back in the fight. Back in the fight. Here we go. Boom. Big old bead.
So while Caleb was up on the roof losing his mind trying to put the rest of the chimney together, I figured that I would come inside to show you the stovepipe setup that we decided to go with. So what you're seeing here is a Supervent double wall steel stovepipe that I ordered from Lowe's. I ordered two sections which slot together and as you can see here the inner tube of the double wall slots inside the neck of the lower pipe to create an overlap which allows any creosote inside the pipe to run down without coming out of the seams. The seam can be covered by a locking band to hide the join if you so wish and a section of the stovepipe that we ordered was actually also a telescoping pipe, meaning that we could extend the pipe to meet the second section perfectly, covering the exact distance between the top of the stove and the ceiling. And this seemed to make installing the actual stovepipe very quick and easy. The stovepipe comes with a sticker on to show you the direction of the flue and following this will make sure you get your pipes connected together the correct way. We had to use an adapter to connect the top portion of the stovepipe to the ceiling box and this adapter slots down inside the top of the stovepipe to keep the creosote running down and then the mouth of the adapter goes over the inner tube of the triple wall chimney pipe to complete the connection, again ensuring that the creosote is always running down inside the pipe. I say all this because depending on whether you choose to go with a double wall or a single wall stovepipe, there is a different rule of thumb for fitting the pipes together correctly and also how the stovepipe gets connected to the chimney pipe. When we were trying to figure out how to install the stove and the chimney correctly, I took a visit to a local heating and plumbing store to chat through what we were doing with a local expert. He shared a lot of information with me and here is what I learned. Traditionally, with a single wall stovepipe, the crimped end of the pipe should be at the bottom. And this is because they all fit inside one another, allowing any creosote that is inside the pipe to run down inside the pipe. And this is what threw us initially because on our pipe, the sticker that was pointing in the direction of the flue made it so that the crimped end of the pipe was actually at the top. Well, this is because double wall pipe is designed differently. So with double wall pipe, the crimped end of the pipe goes up because it's actually fitting between the two walls of the section of pipe above and that creates the same overlapping effect on the inner tubes for the creosote to still run down without leaking out of the seams. You also might be asking why we chose to go with a double wall stovepipe as it might sound counterintuitive to insulate a pipe that could be giving off surface heat to add to the temperature of the room. Well, the science of a good combustion and a better heat output from your stove is actually all to do with airflow, which is created by a good chimney drawer. So what actually happens by insulating the stovepipe with a double wall is that it allows the flue temperature to remain higher which creates a better draw in the chimney and a more efficient burning of the fuel inside the stove. Once we were happy with the fit of the stovepipe between the top of the stove and the ceiling, we were able to secure it into place with some small screws that actually came with the stovepipe to hold the pipe connections in place. And at the top of the pipe, we purchased a cuff or a locking band to cover the seams, but this was more for visual purposes than anything else. The last piece of the stovepipe to go on was the ceiling flashing, which covered the cuts that we made in the drywall on the ceiling when we were fitting the ceiling box. And this was just really to leave everything looking neat and tidy.
going back to the science of a good working chimney flue, the recommendation is that you need to have at least 15 foot of pipe from the top of your stove to the chimney cap to create a good enough draw to efficiently burn your fuel. Well, we were short by about four feet of chimney pipe, which we then had to back order. But once it arrived, it was simply a matter of a twist lock connection that we hope will stand up in the weather. Lastly, don't forget to read the manufacturer's instructions about the best way to break in your stove. We did notice a chemical smell for about the first six hours of burn time, which I read was likely factory paint fumes curing with the heat, and apparently that's quite normal. However, I couldn't stand the smell, so make sure that you're able to have the doors and windows open for some good ventilation. Mm -hmm.